Welcome to episode 48 of New Attack People. Today we have Jonathan, Managing Director, and Chad, Head of Video from Streaming House and Mimblet Digital. Welcome, guys. Hey, hey, thank you. Us. All right, locals in Newcastle, for those that don't know you, who wants to start giving us the overview of uh, who you are to start with? Oh, look, we, Nimbla Digital, started uh, over 10 years ago in Newcastle. Um, digital agency specializing in web development, content marketing, and digital brands. About two years ago, we started a live streaming company, Streaming House, and Chad took the reins of that last November. Nice. You guys do a lot in the video space, obviously. We do. Streaming House. Uh, it, ticks, it ticks my boxes. It's a lot of what we have done here at New Tech People is invest in video. We invest in video really early. Um, you send a lot of growth in that space. I think massively, um, even though the last sort of sort of twelve months that I've been in the game full time, I think it's it's grown the use of video uh, in almost every single business. Now we see if you're not using video, it's like it's what are you what are you doing essentially? Yeah. Um, yes, the, the the market's booming. Yeah, yeah. As I said, like this really uh, it's really sparked my interest. I come from a marketing background. This whole content marketing play is definitely uh, true to my heart. It's definitely something we've invested hard in. What have you guys seen from a trends perspective uh, over the past few years? Companies obviously investing more in marketing, more in video, but is there any sort of overriding trends you're seeing either globally, nationally, or more locally? I'll take this yeah. one if you like. Oh, look, I think from our point of view, we saw an explosion of video because it became so accessible. It was so cheap and easy. It used to be quite expensive. Yeah. Um, and at the same time in marketing circles, you saw – so quantity overtook quality. Um, still the case, I think. What we're seeing now is that the quality side of it is starting to you know, raise its head. Those who look to do quality, those who reimagine what, what a user experience could be using video, generally tend to get the results that they're looking for. So I think there's a move from quantity to quality. Yeah, I think everyone, everyone's got a smartphone, everyone's got a video at hand, right? That's right. Um, which gives everyone the ability to capture content. Yeah, uh, not all content is great content. Um, <laughs> nope. In saying that, some of some of the best content out there is that raw and and true message. Authentic, we call that. Yeah. yeah. And and people can capture that on their own. No, they can. It, it doesn't mean people with a smartphone can't do good video content. No. Um, you know, we have a, a mantra in the office where, you know, once a week you'll hear someone just shout out, "Don't put shit on the net." Yeah. You know, there's enough of that there oh, already. So much. Yeah. And, you know, you can make really good quality video content with an iPhone. You just have to think it through a bit. Yeah. I completely agree. I think even more, probably more so during COVID, right? Like yeah. I've yeah. found we've been putting out a bunch of video content for a long while. And I think during COVID, there's a lot of, you know, sales gurus around and business consultants around and being like, you've got to talk to your customers. You can't get out in front of them. Uh, okay. Right. You've got to be putting out video content. So every man and these dogs now putting out video yeah, content. So true. Yeah. Um, I think the key, what you mentioned before, is about that quality. It's not even the, so the, A, the quality of the actual video itself, but B, is more so that messaging and the value add. So for me, the differentiator is, you know, what value add are you providing to your audience? Yeah. So is that the sort of conversations you're having with clients? Absolutely. Look, the, it's so easy when you're doing video content, um, and, and it's a little bit like social media, to, to make it all about you. Yeah. Um, because that's what you can film easily. Yeah. But if you stop and think it through, what is the experience of your user and your audience and your target market? You tend to make different types of, of content. Um, like social media, if you're talking about yourself all day, people will switch off. Um, if you're putting out content that people resonate with, learn from, are entertained by, um, that's where you, you get them engaging. And that's sometimes not quite so easy to produce. Completely agree. I completely agree. One of the stories you've told me a bit off air just before is in around the tech space and, and building your own software. And there's a growing arm to your business in around that. It's something true to my heart. It's something I think the audience would find quite interesting. There's um, for a bit of context, a lot of our audience is obviously technical. And I think in the startup space in Newcastle, which I've had quite a bit to do with, there's people who you know want to scratch their own itch or, or or build a play with a little bit of software. Can you tell me about the story of the growing, the growing software element to, to yeah. Nimbler. Yeah, we've got, got, we got a couple yeah. of those. Yeah. I'll, I'll talk Nimbler. You talk yeah, streaming house. Um, with Nimbler, we uh, we found that reporting for our clients was the most important thing we could deliver as a value, and it was taking us hours to collate all the information 
and we're a HubSpot partner, so we've got a really good automation platform yep. with plenty of reporting, but um, it just wasn't quite hitting the mark we wanted to hit for our clients. So we set about writing a piece of software that actually sucks the data from every touch point, um, you know, from their phone systems right through to their social media. And it now takes us, you know, sort of about half an hour to pull together an entire monthly report, totally formatted, totally branded. Um, and our clients really love it. It just gets loaded into the back end of their website too. So whether we present it to them or not, they've got access to that report straight away. All right, let's, I want to just stay here yeah. for a sec. So you've built that in-house yourself? We have, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Has, took a bit longer than we thought, but we got there. I and, think that, uh, that is the case with software. There's yeah. not too many software projects <laughs> so or teams true, that yeah. I'm working with that are like, I've delivered that on time and on budget every time. <laughs> yep, said nobody else. <laughs> yeah. um, so if we talked about that, so you had internal development capability. Yeah, yeah, always have and yeah. always will. Yeah, uh, obviously coming, building a lot of websites and, and working from that side, you've obviously got that. We were pretty strong in the back end of things at that point. We had some really good, strong back end developers. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it looked easy. It wasn't, uh, is, as is always the case, but they pulled through. Yeah. And it's just saved us so much time, but also gave us the chance to focus on how to present this in a way that's really useful for clients. Yeah. Um, and as a client, there are so many people who've, you know, slapped a very large analytics report on the table and said, there you go. It's not useful. Yeah, uh, you want the data to be extracted in a way that you can quickly see how you've gone, what where the weaknesses are, what you want to go forward. So we got a chance, and I guess that's the value of having those in-house developers is we could fart ass around until we got the right thing. And yeah. I'm sure we drove our developers crazy, but now it's one of the the sort of cornerstones of what we do for for our clients. And again, that's that scratch your own itch. You're building that's it right. for yourself. We have had a couple of approaches for it. Yeah, I was about yeah. to say that's where yeah. we're going next. Is is that a potential revenue source down the down the track to white label that and provide that as a, a service to other agencies? It's certainly something we've got an eye on. Yeah. Um, we thought we'd look at it when COVID hit and things slowed down a bit. Yeah, we looked at something else and it's caused an explosion <laughs> elsewhere that we're very happy about. Yeah. But um, it's yeah, so it's still on the back burner. It's servicing our clients, but once every couple of months we get someone calling saying those reports can we get that software that helps us put those together yeah um so down the track a bit when we're uh, when we're a bit more settled mm -hmm. we'll probably look at taking that a bit further yeah nice well that's it if you're providing that for your clients at the moment you can obviously you know, integrate that with your current fees but mm. the real value add um that can be you know a very valuable to other well, it'll obviously. be a it'll be a whole vein we'll put somebody in charge of it and yeah. uh, and away they go i love that i love uh you know that something creation out of nothing or a business creation out of a you know side business or a side project um always talking to tech professionals about having side projects or having something that you can build on the side or you know just to stay technical i, I think it's super relevant for for people to say it is it is and look we encourage it in our ranks as well you know if you've got a, a pet project or an idea you want to get up and running don't try and do it from you know 11 o'clock till three o'clock in no. the morning at home Bring it in, yeah. use the team, let's all get together and make make it sort of, you know, get it to a, um, you know, to a, at least a startup point. Yeah, um, like with concept or MVP, right? right? Yep. Yeah. Well, I think Google does that, right? Google has 20% of work hours or something like that. that they, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or is it twenty percent? It might be less than that. I think it's. I think it's twenty percent. They have um, whole days where everyone just stops and does their own things and brings it to the table. That's a good way. We've, to we'd love to do that. We're not quite big enough, but we've <laughs> talked about it soon. Yeah, I think. <laughs> uh, I think twenty percent is a big shot. Yeah, it's massive. If I gave uh, everyone twenty percent of the, the days, I'm not sure uh, all our know. clients would really want to pay for that. <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, it'll come. Yeah. Uh, I agree, but it is a a way of trying to generate innovation within a company. Um, which is a challenge for a lot of companies. So it's, it's really exciting to hear you guys are at least uh, encouraging that internally. And yeah. then, so you, that's part A, and then I hear the same happening on the streaming house side as well. Yeah, so COVID hit, and um, there was a, there was a very much a need, a lot of, lot of physical like environments couldn't happen anymore, physical conferences and um, things you could actually go to couldn't happen. So kind of were going oh something's happening i think we need to sort of we were working on a project that was sort of a live conferency type thing and then COVID hit and it was like uh no we're working on this live conference thing now we're going to do this live and actually we're 
to the point where we're, we now have a, a, a big client that we're doing 14, 13, 14 live streams simultaneously for those guys using the platform we designed. So when it got quiet yeah. during COVID, we'd been tinkering with this idea of, um, of a platform that allowed clients to run their live streamed events yeah. on a website. Yeah. yeah, Like social media is great. There's lots of reasons why you would stream to, to social media, but there are times when you want to control that a little bit more, um, where you want to have the privacy, you want to have the copyright, um, and having a quick and easy and branded website that's templatized, up it goes, yeah. and within minutes you're playing through that. Uh, that has a few extra, you know, video on demand tab and oh, uh, well. um, yep, all of those things. Um, so we'd been tinkering with that for a couple of years, and when it got quiet at the beginning of COVID, there was nothing else to do. So it was like, hey, let's focus on that because we're getting a lot of calls for conferences and things. And yep. sure enough, within two weeks, we were ready, and people couldn't even run conferences from a conference venue. So I remember we ran around doing quotes for about two weeks for big conferences. We'll send 10 cameras. We'll have them on the stage. And then they all got canned. Canned. You know, <laughs> the, the government makes a call and suddenly, no, we're not doing those. No. We just happened to have that platform ready where we said, you know what, we have this page. It can be designed to look like your event. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a web uh, link. So they don't have to be hooked into, soft, into social and um, all your presenters, multiple presenters, can be at home. Yeah, dialed in. Um, and they don't look like it doesn't look like a Zoom meeting. It's no. actually got a lot more going for it. It's got interactivity, Q and A, uh, live feedback, and they jumped at it. It was just the right product at the right time. And then they got bigger. We offered a custom-made version of that where we can add functionality. And um, you know, lo and behold, we're we're doing massive projects yeah, it's now. Scaled it was, and the thing is, the thing about all the other ones like Zoom, you can scale to a lot, a lot, of, a lot of like big size, a lot of numbers. But we were able to like implement this one thing, and then it can grow and grow and grow. So there's the ability to scale, which is something like I don't think it's ever. Uh, well, Zoom's, Zoom's good to up to about fifty people, yeah. and then it starts to break down pretty quickly. And then these people start looking really, really small. Yeah. So we were like, yeah, let's let's we can do that sort of alternative because a lot of um, a lot of like foundations, a lot of institutions were doing. It's Zoom, and they don't have as much control over the look and feel and, yeah. and their branding and stuff. It's literally just a black screen and a bunch of faces. So we wanted to really diversify that and make something that you can control from the ground up, from what it looks like inside to the actual website. So yeah, that's nice. what we developed. Over, it over can the- be deployed within. Yeah. That's phenomenal. Yeah. Um, I'm excited about it. <laughs> oh, I'm thinking about different things. <laughs> yeah. 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 Still excited about it. Yeah. yeah. Ah, that's exciting and very relevant. It's going to be relevant going forward, mm-hmm. I think. Um, we do a lot at New Tech, people trying to um, promote the, the local meetup scene and things like that. And, um, there's some of the meetups, that you, 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 lose that, you lose that interactivity um, once you go to a Zoom meeting and yep. you definitely numbers fall off and things like that. A child that. jumps into the, the right. shot, a, a dog starts barking, yeah. yeah, all that stuff. So having a platform for that that encourages that interactivity on top of the actual video content um, and we can, really we can actually manage the whole thing yeah. remotely. Yeah. So you know, often Chad from his home in, where are we going to say you live? Singleton. Mm, Singleton, um, Maitland. <laughs> has the setup in his home office. The hunter. And, hunter. Uh, yeah, in the hunter. Yeah. Um, and we also found that it's an ideal platform for podcasting yeah. as well. Yeah, nice. Um, it, it, that came out of like, we need a necessity. We have this podcast to record. We have to keep, we have, we have a podcast we have to record. Let's get that done. What can we do? And I was like, give me a day. And I thought about it and I was like, ah, oh, what can we use? I know the, we can use the same platform we're using to do these live streams for people. Why don't we just use that? And all the audio comes in and it's all synced up. It's within like 400 milliseconds of each other. You're getting all the, the audio and stuff in. So yeah, it, it became this thing we built that could be this other thing we can do, which like it just opened the world of opportunity for live streaming. And I mean, they can keep or throw away the video element, but they're looking yeah. at each other, yeah. which yeah. is important in a yeah. podcast. Oh, that exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so uh, we've, yeah. you know, and we had this Adobe Martech Talk podcast yeah. series we were producing. The host is in Singapore. Mm-hmm. Uh, the agency is in Sydney. The client's in New Zealand, yeah. in Auckland. Yeah. And we're in Maitland, yeah. you know, yeah. sort of doing our thing. Remotely. Yeah. Um, and it, it all came together beautifully. 
So yeah, um, they've ordered another series and away we go. That's great. Again, scratching your own itch, right? That's right. And then also probably the other part of that is just solving a problem. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of companies or a lot of, you know, people have an idea about it, something, but not knowing who that audience is or who, who are your customers here, but your customers obviously internally, it's yourself. And then yeah. once you've built it for yourself, you can take that externally and um, right. sell that. Yeah. And look, I, I've, I've noticed a couple of other companies have solved the same problem in a different way, and yeah. I love seeing that. I think, yeah. the, can we mention their name? There's a company called Sage Events who have done – who have dealt with the same thing we have yeah. by having by building their own custom made studio with walls of yeah. of Zoom meeting screens and the presenter standing in front of these massive walls. Yeah. Both of them will do the same job. Yeah. They'll just do it differently. If you don't have a competitor, is it a problem? Is it a problem worth solving? Right. Like it, the That's fact right. that you've got a competitor there actually gives a lot of premise to the fact that Look, it is a very it real problem. It just gives clients alternatives and, and options. You know, yeah. I, I'm looking at that one going, well, they couldn't have done that because their host was in Singapore. Yeah. Uh, whereas, you know, we've got things where, you know, if, if their host and everybody else is in the one place, i.e. Sydney or Melbourne or Newey, yeah. um, that might work really well. There might be a dynamic in that that works as well as ours. Nice. Um, and I, I love watching that too. I, I, I've noticed over the last three or four months, there's been some real ingenuity mm. in in how that's been done. And we've pushed it pretty hard. Our, our mantra is reimagine how you talk to your customers now yeah. and how you interact with your customers. Um, and it's just that constant force of reimagining uh, is a really good and it's an enjoyable thing too. We're not, you know, we're not cookie, cookie cutting. No. Yeah. There's some really great ideas out there that aren't ours yep. and I love watching those. I want to play with them. I want to get on one of those conferences um, because we've, yeah, we've got enough going on. We'll get ideas from that. And isn't that how it always works? You know, you do something, then somebody gets an idea and bounces off that. Mm -hmm. um, that whole collaborative um, technique is something that, you know, as probably the oldest guy in the room, I'm still battling to really get my head around, but I love it. I've gone from fearing it to loving it now, that sort of collaborate, collaborate. Yeah. Um, and that's a good thing. Oh, I completely agree. Hey, the collaboration, you can leverage other people's know-how. Um, there's a lot of, you know, different people can bring different things to, to, to the table. And live without fear. Just yeah. go with it. I think this whole time has shown us that we can trust. Like before COVID hit, was from our experience, you know, it would be maybe thirty percent of people would do live streams, and then and actually one of my my counterparts in Sydney, he would do a pre recorded live pre recorded live streaming um, that he would get them to play because they didn't trust the people that they were they were presenting, and now COVID has won has made working from home like a thing we have to do, and we've you know we we were able to embrace that like um, and there's some techniques you probably talk about if you want to, but like the it's gone from this thing we fear and that's every generation to now it's the thing we must trust to get life happening yeah and i think it's very philosophical thank you yeah. uh <laughs> but i think the, the fact that we have trust in it means that we can evolve the way we do things at a faster pace than we were before because before it was like oh it's a thing that we kind of push away that's forced change yeah that's, and it's great i think uh, you know unfortunately with the, the COVID being so tragic it still has been a great time for evolution of everything. Definitely um, the trust piece on, yeah. um, from my perspective, a lot of the companies I work with, working from home, working yeah. remotely, right? That trust piece. There are some companies that wouldn't trust their employees to work yeah, from home sorry. because, hey, how do I know if they're working or not? <laughs> yeah. um, because I can't see them. Whereas, and they would have had no work from home policies, right? Or That's right. they had a policy, you can't work from yeah, home. Yeah, the policy is no. <laughs> and, until they're forced to. And yeah. now they're forced to. Camp, people are working from home. Work is still being done. Yeah. Um, once, once COVID's gone, <laughs> how, how do you manage that? You can't have that same conversation with somebody That's right. in the future that says, no, you know, we can't work from home at all no. because, you know, you won't get work done. We, well, we just we did that for, it. for Look, six I think, months. I think some of the 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 – challenges to business segments that are going to come out of this are, are fascinating as well. We, um, we started looking at a remote model about a year ago and it scared me. It scared me because for my entire working career, building a brand and building a culture in an organization was around what happened when those people were in the same building. And I couldn't get my head around how do we do it when they're all not in the building. And I read books, 
Um, I interviewed companies when I went to the States that had done it successfully. I was really looking to try and find a way to get my head over that hump as, a, as a, an employer that has for years and years had good company cultures, but that's because we're all in the same room. We're high-fiving, yeah. there's water coolers, there's posters on the wall, we're mm-hmm. way to go. We were ready. I think we were a little bit more ready for it when COVID hit. I wasn't quite there, but we'd done all the homework. Mm. And so when it was time to send everyone home, we had a blueprint. You know, I've got a business administration manager and she and I looked at it and went, well, we've actually been planning for this for a while. I just hadn't taken the step. Yeah. So when we did it, we found that um, the advantages to our team dynamic, implementing some of the things we'd learnt and put in our blueprint um, meant that our teams are, are much more productive mm. yeah. um, now. So. We've, we've agreed as a team that we're going to go back into the office one day every two weeks for the yep. next six months until our lease runs out yep. because we work better this way. Um, and the, the brand, the, the culture is stronger now than it's ever been. And yeah. I think the reason why that has worked so well is that when, you, when we did go home, you made the choice of going, yeah, but every single morning we, work, we, we get up, we go, and it's 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock is the time we all meet. We all talk. You can talk about that if you want to. Uh, but we all meet and have a chat and it sets your day up. Because you, yes. you drive into work and then you yeah. walk in and you sort of do it and then you turn your computer on at 9 o'clock or 8.30. We were having trouble putting whips together, like work in progress meetings once a week with everyone met in the office. We couldn't do it. No. We were re- Someone was away. Someone was sick. Someone was at a client meeting that shouldn't have been scheduled. Yeah. Mostly me. All of those things were just holding us back there and now we have one a day and everyone's there bang on time ready you know we put a crazy thing into that to to create some team yeah bonus the stuff i'd read about yeah um and it's worked yeah and uh now it's uh, it's a, an essential part of our day and everyone loves it yeah it's funny it's funny how you know these sort of oh, the pand- pandemic here has forced change upon people and some people adapt and some people won't um and the companies that do adapt will succeed and thrive through that and others won't, and they will be no longer. That's right. Some of them through their own fault, some of them through no fault of their own. Um, it's just, that's change, right? But that's it, right. it's forced changes upon other businesses. Yeah. Yeah. My wife's in and uh, works for another IT company, and they too have made that move. So now we're going through that battle of shit. We've got two home offices to set up permanently now. Yeah. How do we do this? So we're fighting over spare rooms and sunrooms and things <laughs> oh, like yeah. that, trying to yeah, work it out. There's a lot of challenges. So. Yeah. You know? I think uh, apartments, you know, having a look, does it have a study oh, yeah. or does it yeah. have a second bedroom we can use for a study yeah. will potentially Present become something that, you know, people are looking for in the future. It will be very interesting. I definitely wouldn't want to be in the old, uh, the commercial real estate game right now. No, well, that's, uh, we were, somebody was talking about this in one of the Adobe podcasts we were producing and, uh, and one of our clients had a very interesting perspective. We all negotiated, well, those of us that could negotiated lower rent. Yep. particularly the retail spaces that just couldn't open. And as we come back, um, there's a lot of them, I think it's the Accent Group, have, um, you know, and they've got athletes' foot and sketches mm-hmm. and platypus, et cetera, and that they're coming back to their landlords, renegotiating their contracts, and, you know, without blowing too many trade secrets, the rent they pay is going to be result, going to be determined by the success of the business, which is a very new model for retail um landlords yeah. yeah and it'll be really interesting to see how that happens um ours said well tell us how give us your figures and we'll adjust the rent and i had to work out whether we were comfortable with that or not yeah um there's going to be massive change in that uh, commercial leasing space yeah. as a result of this especially with an online business like yours and a growing software element or, yeah. um to that yeah your success is not going to be determined by the fact that you've got a physical presence anywhere that's right well for for quite a while now we've been looking we've got clients in sydney and melbourne yeah. and for about a year we had an office in melbourne and we were flying down to service our clients and be in that office we couldn't quite we weren't quite at the point where we could hire staff in melbourne because there wasn't quite enough business to justify it so we were holding off and holding off now i mean i've hired a new head of development in our organization he'd never entered the building before we gave him the job yeah Yeah. our old one moved on and uh, in the middle of covid i'm interviewing for one of the most important positions in the company and yeah, he'd started for us. He'd been working with us for a month before I actually met him face to face. And you know, and, and he's a tall, how tall he was. He's huge. <laughs> tall boy. He's a tall boy. But, um, I had no idea. Know, and, and those, you know, it was funny when all the staff came back together. Two of them had hadn't met 
everyone else. Everyone else. Yeah. So lots of, you know, you're taller than I thought. You're smaller than I thought. I think, you know, I think the biggest thing is that we wouldn't have been where we are with the work from home stuff if it wasn't for the technology that's available to us right now. Very true. Yeah. You know. Yeah. On that, yeah. on that note, and yeah. what technologies are you guys using to to enable this work from home? I you're the tech guy. All right. Well, so we are using we are using Zoom. Yeah. Um, we are using um, our platform to do meetings. Actually, it's been a very cool way to have a meeting. So we were able to bring people in who will maybe want to use the platform. We'll actually go, here's a link. Just click that on. Once you just open up your browser, you can just jump into our platform and have a look. So we're able to actually meet them and show them whilst they're on screen what, what they're going to be experiencing. That's been pretty cool. Um, we've used... Phoenix, um, a lot of um, like like um, Facebook. Uh, we've been using a lot of Google Hangouts, and we've been like back and forth. Lots of like the most amount of emails. I think I've never seen the most emails in my inbox ever. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, it's it's funny. I, I was saying to you beforehand that um, because all of our clients have their own platforms yeah. as well, yeah. Yeah. we well, have to be um, very agnostic yeah. Yeah. from our home offices. Yeah. So, you know, Google Hangouts to Blue Jeans to yep. Zoom to VMix to. I think I've got them all downloaded yep. on yeah. my Mac. Yeah. yeah. And we're, we're bouncing around all day. I never knew um, Blue Jeans existed until we had someone go, hey, can you use some Blue Jeans? I'm like, what well, isn't that thing you buy at the shop? Yeah. I'm like, no, no, it's a platform you get on. I'm like, okay. So we did. And now we're on there as well. I think LinkedIn uses Blue Jeans. I think that's where I've been using yeah. it. Uh, yep. Yeah. Microsoft Teams. And it also, like, LinkedIn, all the, all the video chats, like, because our clientele is so varied, as you said, we have to be we have to be agnostic. We have to go, okay, okay yep, sweet, we'll do that. Done, we're there. Um, Sometimes you're staring at the wrong camera on it. <laughs> yeah, you're like, hey guys, oh, it's over here. Hi guys, one second, I just move the camera over here. Yeah, we have that. You guys mentioned earlier, and I think it was when we we're talking about different parts of the business, different priorities, managing different priorities. So if we can tie that into this productivity type conversation. Is there a philosophy? Is there a a method? Um, a software piece of software? Is there any Go for it. anything you use to to manage those different the differentiating priorities within the business? Yeah, look, it's a it's a really good question, and has tested just that need to be agile in that space has yep. tested us particularly over the last three or four months. Nimble, if you will. Nimble is not what we were for a while with how we were dealing with um, that, but. Uh, again, a year's worth of research, and over in Boston, I met with a company that actually started in Wollongong. Crazy. Um, uh, that's a project management CRM software called a Cello or a Cello. Yeah. Um, now, because we have so many different processes in our business, things like Trello, Monday.com, etc., yeah, um, Jira, we had used them all. And every single one of them was great to a point, and then be, there'd be something that it didn't do. Yeah. And uh, look, several years of people suggesting these things. And it's like we tried that a year ago. It didn't. You know, it doesn't do this. We tried that a year ago. It doesn't do this. Uh, Accelo's been the first one that I've seen um, where I, I've kind of gone, guys. I think this does it all, and everyone's tested it. And it's a six-week implementation across our entire organization now, but we're right in the middle of it. Mm. All right. um, and we're really looking forward to it because the, the control it gives me without being hands-on is really important, but the support it gives account yeah. managers and project yeah. managers to keep things running. And, of course, our accounts team are linked in. Yeah. There's access that clients can have to projects. Yeah, nice. And there's a great calendar that um, means I can see what everyone's doing. And they can, everyone can see each other's diaries yeah. Yeah. and sort of go on the platform they want. As I'm well. not going to ring you and say you're available on Wednesday. I can see you're not. So yeah. I'm going to just go and see if Thursday or Friday works, saving us so much time. And so and many people have, sorry, so many people have a preference. Some people like Outlook, some people like Google, like calendars, some people like just about iPhone calendars. It just meshes all we together. We like an ad for a cello, don't we? Yeah, yeah no, but, I, but uh, the reason you sold me on it because I'm, I'm pretty, I'm like, I like this is that it does everything I need it to do. So that's kind of, I'm really looking forward to it being fully fledged in our business. Yeah, projects and retainers, yeah. things yeah. like that. So, really, so we're excited about it. We're all sort of- I'm excited, excited about it. We're in the middle of <laughs> yeah. training and implementation. I think we go live in about two weeks. Yeah, yeah that's nice. And that was the other thing. I was looking for the, that 
peel that sort of, you know, what software can I get that fixes everything? And our first attempt failed because it was very much a, I think I saw it too much as a, a golden, a silver bullet. Yeah. And I will get that and everything will be fine. But it's actually a 12-month process of changing our culture to work with it. I think a lot at that point, exactly. I think very rarely is it the software's fault. Um, oh, I've used yeah. enough software yeah, and that's right. tools in my day. they got more features than you can poke a stick at. It's, you know, does your culture match it? Are you actually going to use it? Do you use it properly? Do you use it consistently? You know, the, the data right. that you can get out of it is only as, the data, as good as the data. And look, we were in, quite right? ill-disciplined in that space. Yeah. And as a group, we decided, listen, a cello will be go live in six weeks. That's yep. our chance to practice getting all our old antiquated manual systems. We've all got to apply ourselves to be the people that use the systems properly. So even that's lifted our game in the yeah. last few weeks. Yeah. And we're still using spreadsheets in some cases. Yeah, that's something we're focused on. We're doing a lot well. more with it now. Yeah. Uh, that is a response as well. Yeah, I think COVID provided that opportunity for us yeah. as well. Where we made some uh, some calls to improve our back end processes, and we automate. Uh, we implemented a new automation tool as well. So, which know, one? Uh, it's a it's a product specific to. We use Bullhorn as our okay. like, tracking system CRM, and this product's called Sense, and it takes a lot of the data and then makes automation off the data in there. So they they tie in really smoothly together. Let's call it a little bit recruitment specific. So. Not overly exciting, but, you know, those are the sort of things uh, that should help your uh, business. It's, yeah. it's, it's an industry that's had a lot of players doing that, hasn't yeah. it? Yeah. So you're finding the one that works for you is, is really good. Yeah. I agree. I agree. You guys have built software internally. I think there's a lot of companies that I work with that have made a play to do that, either using an external agency to do that, to build some software to either automate some of their processes internally yep. or fix one of their own needs. Some of them are going to step further than that and hide internal development capability. If you were to provide any advice based on your experience, if a company's got a problem, they're looking for software to be a fix of that, is, is it look externally to start with? Is it build that internal capability? If you had to, there, there's no one fix for, for every company, no, but not. if you had to provide some advice, you've had some success to any companies that are looking to, to look at software in fixing internal processes, scratching their own need, what advice would you give? My advice would be get someone to consult with you to prepare the brief or the scope. Pay them separately to the people you're paying, if it's an external or an internal, for the execution, but get the scope done first by a professional. Um, pay them well, let them spend the time, because that scope I find is the, is, is the be all and end all of things going well or badly. External agencies or ex, even external development companies, and there's some really good ones in Newcastle, there is. Um, are still at the whim if they're squeezed for time and there's not a really well thought through scope at the beginning, mm -hmm. then there's inevitably, inevitably problems and blowouts as the thing gets closer to, to completion. But if you spend, it's like you know, measure twice, cut once. Mm. Get an external to come in and pull that scope, do that scoping process, and then it may be that having an internal is the right way to go because you need someone very close to the operations. Or if it's a big project, then take that scope to the um, to the external. I find that um, you know whenever things, whenever projects like that, we've either done them, executed them for people. That scoping process is undervalued. Yeah, you know everybody's trying to win that big project, so they squeeze their their dollars down. And where we're taking it out is the time to scope properly. Yeah, um, and if you get that scope right, everything, no matter which way you do it, um, will will work. It's the roadmap. Nice. That's the only advice I got. That's really good advice. I think yeah, it's you know measuring it's hard advice. When it comes to providing advice, is there a book or a podcast or any piece of content that both of you have consumed that you think, hey, that's been highly valuable to me. It's something I'd recommend to others. I read quite a few books. I, I do audio books a lot. Um, there's four that have really made a difference to me in the last year. One is called Remote. Yeah, uh, I've forgotten who the author for that one is, but it was we'll really good. We'll find it and link it up. Yeah. yeah. Deep Work by Cal Newport, uh, an amazing read. Atomic Habits has made a big difference to me. And then one that's more personal, I think, is um, Supernormal uh, by Meg Jays. Yeah. And uh, that was personally for me, it unlocked a lot of things for me in terms of my leadership styles and the way I operate. 
Um, yeah, there's a pretty quick dump of some titles there, but yeah, yeah, they're the I've, four that have made a big difference to me. Mm. Yep, I'm about. I'm just started reading Atomic Habits again. Yeah, um, I had a huge shift in my health immediately having read that book, and so much so that I got really excited by it. It's it's been permanent. It stayed with me. I want to go back and do that, read it again, and have another idea yeah, nice. um, and apply those principles. So it's I recommend that book. Nice. What about you? Uh, I think for me, um, one of the biggest ones was um, Darren Brown's the uh, the Confessions of a Conjurer. And it seems weird, but um, the way he thinks about he it's it's a it's a a book that goes through. It's an audio book that I've read, uh, had listened to, read, listened to, listened to that I it read uh, that goes through the the start and or at the end of 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 a trick around with people, and it goes through his thought processes. For me, that was really interesting because he's all about the intricacies of people, and I'm a massive fan of of people like Robert Kiyosaki and and Richard Branson for the way that they're able to well, one, be themselves, be quirky, but also uh, a, a ability to, you know, bring people around them that's a team. And I'm a massive person who loves teams. Um, and so moving forward in our business at the moment, where it's scaling up quite quickly, I have to, I have to bring um, a leadership perspective and the way that people think and, and what, they, what they do to my work. So those are the ones that really me. That's nice. And I have not had that recommended no. before. So uh, there you go. That's great. <laughs> That's good. Follow on question to that. Is there anyone in particular uh, that you would recommend people follow for good quality information? I don't know that it's universal, but uh, I was put onto the Mojo radio show um, a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, look, there are a couple of middle-aged white men that run that mm -hmm. uh, and, and comes with that warning. But the people they interview are extraordinary and the way they extract their life lessons um, in a really fun way once a week. Yeah, it's it's probably my go-to. Nice. Do you know it? No. Gary Burt Whistle. Yeah, right. I might check that out. Mm. Now I'm uh, on the road again and I'm out and about a little bit more. The podcast time is uh, about to increase no, again. No, couldn't, couldn't speak highly enough of it. Yeah, right. And for me, it's um, the No Budget Film School. They talk like about the film. Obviously, I'm the head of video, so it's massive for me, but they talk about projects that, that they do the equipment they use all that stuff i'm a massive camera geek so that and also um i check out uh everything at nab over in america although they have they're probably not gonna hold one this year all the tech equipment for you know photography and film and stuff yeah. like that and then i um i also listen to um no film school which is uh, another one that's about tech and about um the way to use visuals to storytelling oh, for me appreciate it appreciate your time coming in today i would have thought you know pe people that you know would look at you as like obviously as a digital agency and a video arm uh, and i think you know once you open and lift under the hood and you see you see everything that's going on um building your own technology i think it's an exciting story and hopefully you know really growing arm of your business as well in the future so Look, you've, you've spiked my uh, enthusiasm for, for both those projects. Absolutely. I'll go back to the office and start planning it a little bit more Absolutely. Uh, immediately oh. than I was. No, I, I love hearing about companies, you know, being forced to change and then leveraging that change, leveraging that, looking at it as an opportunity and uh, seeing where that could take you. So exciting times. Oh, thank, thank you. Oh, they are. And thanks for coming in today. No, thanks for having thanks us. Cheers. Yeah.